Good. Perfect. Okay, so um, we're going to jump straight into things. Um, but first off, can you give a bit of background of yourself and Seed Legals? I'm sure everyone here is already familiar with Seed Legals, but for the one person who isn't. And then Leonie, we're actually, otherwise I'm going to forget. So I just want to get your question answered off the bat after a little introduction. All right. So, hey, everyone. I'm Anthony. I'm founder and CEO at Seed Legals. Um, and uh, I see many familiar faces on the call. Uh, so I'm guessing a good fraction of people know Seed Legals. But if not, it's the fastest way to close your next funding round. And of course, if you haven't got all the investors for the round, then you can use Agile fundraising to raise ahead of a round or top up a last round. So uh, anything to do with fundraising, we're here to help. All right, and, and and of course, also not fundraising like this call, all the things to help you, even for the things we're not trying to sell. Perfect. So today we're going to touch on um, KPIs, balancing growth versus prof profitability, pricing and product roadmap. But Leonie's question was around cleaning up a cap table from the previous round and also a bit of like cap table best practices for the next round. All right. So uh, great point. And I've written an article on was, what is a clean cap table and why you probably don't need it. So once upon a time, you used to send out share certificates like on pieces of paper and people would have to meet at the lawyer's office to sign documents. So if you had 100 shareholders, it was really an admin nightmare. But these days it's all electronic, whether you've got like one person or 100, it's literally one, the same number of three clicks on seed legals. So I'm not convinced that having fewer people on your cap table is necessarily better. And in fact, there's an opposite argument that if you had 50 small shareholders, remember most things where you need investor consent, it needs to be 50 by percent by total number of shares held. And if you've got lots of small investors, it's like any combination of them will do the trick. Whereas if you roll them up into one roll up or nominee, you now maybe have concentrated power with one individual that needs to vote. So, um, the, so, so firstly, I'm not convinced that it's a necessary thing to do. We've got 50 shareholders in our cap table. It's great. Periodically, in one click, I message them all. But if you really want to, we're about to launch roll-ups, seed legals roll-ups. So if you want to roll up your investor, as it's often called, into a nominee, you should be able to do that super easily on Seed Legals. If you know Seed Legals for the round, starting at about six weeks' time, you'll be able to drag and drop your investors to be investing directly or in a roll-up, which will be Seed Legals nominees. And then you can say the roll-up as a group has no votes or somebody votes on behalf of it or they vote collectively. So that's coming soon. So the short answer is you probably don't need it, but if you do, I should be able to help you with it. Perfect. Okay, so um, I want to, perfect. Okay, I want to touch a bit on the first like two years or so of seed legals. What were the first metrics that you were focusing on, and also like what were the what was the first product you launched, and then the second one, and how did you decide what the second product was going to be? So uh, metrics are fascinating because I'm never sure whether you start with the goal of metrics or you kind of make them up backwards depending on what you found. So, you know, if you are fortunate and you find so-called product market fit quite quickly, which is you've launched something and amazingly people want what you've launched and, and what you've got, then you're on a roll. Uh, if, however, you've launched something and, you know, the uptake isn't there or maybe people are are signing up but not buying, you now need to figure out how are you firstly going to get to the product that your users want? And then number two, how are you going to spend your marketing or sales money wisely to grow the business? So on C Legal, when in my previous startups, I should say, taking a step back, there were more social networks. And social networks you only have a monetization model when you reach scale. So life gets very stressful where you raise investment money. You think you've got lots of money in the bank and then slowly it goes down each month and you're using it to acquire customers, but you're not making any money from each customer because that only comes later. And now your problem is if you start using pay-per-click ads or you're buying Facebook ads because that's, you know, for social, that's the way to go. Each customer is costing you and you're not making anything back from it. And that's a difficult position. 
if you're in the fortunate position of having a business that uh, either is a SaaS fintech business or, of course, has any revenue model per customer, then as long as your customer lifetime value is greater than your customer acquisition cost, you can now spend more money to acquire customers knowing that you'll make that later on. And of course, if you don't have the money initially to ramp that up, that's what raising investment is all about. So at Seed Legals, we're in the fortunate position, I mean, it's not been the same for all of my startups, of having a product that is a purchased product, an audience that is addressable, and 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 a, a lifetime value that's greater than the customer acquisition cost, uh, you know, to use the normal marketing terminology. So I think that uh, then coming to metrics, it's quite interesting the different metrics that you have across the team. So initially, your first metric might be um, users. So can we just get people signing up and using it? Even before that, it might be intent. You know, how many people are signing up to for our product hunt campaign or you know, putting their email address to call me later. But let's say your first one is probably going to be users. And then your next one might be uh, the number of paid users. And then your next one might be something to do with the cost per user compared to the lifetime value. You'll also want to have a net promoter score or satisfaction. For those not familiar with net promoter score, it's a score from generally one to 10. And uh, nine or 10 means they're going to tell their friends about you. And less than about six is uh, means that it's mere or a detractor. And so having uh, surveying your customers to see what your net promoter score is, is really useful in, in case it turns out that parts of your business are not giving your customers a great time. But, but I think what usually happens is in the ideal world, your best metric is revenue, which is growing month on month. But of course, you go, thanks, Anthony. It was really useful, but completely useless because we're not even there yet. OK, great. So if you don't have revenue, you might have signed up customers. And if you don't have signed up customers, you might have visitors to your website. And if you don't yet have that, then it might be uh, you know, letters of intent for B2B partnerships. Uh, or it might be meetings that you've got. So you're working backwards as far as you can get to, but you always want to try growth and try and show growth and traction. But of course, the closer you get to revenue, the more investable you are, at least by later stage investors. And if you don't have revenue, you're probably largely wasting your time talking to funds other than as a learning experience. So uh, so, so that's the 101 on uh on metrics. I'm not sure if I fully answered the question, uh, but I know the first question in the list that you gave me was the rather fascinating one on, on how fast you grow and do you grow organically or not. And I think that links very much to the next question. My next, yeah, my next question is going to be how do you map out your customer roadmap um, or sorry, your product roadmap? Um, and how often are you speaking with, or guess what's the relationship between your conversations with customers and your product roadmap? But feel okay. free to tie that in with the, you know. Yeah, well, let's, let, let's do that first. So I think uh, many on the call would know that I've answered their emails probably at 2 a.m. or hopped on calls with them, as you can notice that I'm a very customer uh, focused, uh, insanely so, my team will tell you, but uh, but but that's not the same for all founders. And I've done that partially by experience and partially by passion. But I think too often founders and their team sit, you know, in in their office or now at home and pontificate at what people want and actually don't really go out and talk to them. And talking to them is uh, absolutely essential. Some founders, you know, maybe you're the doctor, dialysis machine talking to people isn't you know, the thing you like to do, or you're the tech person, you'd prefer to talk to a computer, not another human. But if you don't get out and talk to people, then you'll never know what they want. And you'll be forever building things that you hope people will want, and they, they, they want something else. And simply talking to customers is essential. Now, for most founders, they're often the first sales people in the business. You know, I personally was on a beanbag talking to customers in the corridor outside our office, so I didn't disturb people. Um, but by 
having everyone in the business as close to customers as possible, you're going to get firstly the best product and secondly, learn what customers really want because you always initially build probably 50% or double what customers really want. I mean, we all see in Microsoft Word, there are way more features and, and they've been doing this for years. But, uh, you know, when we started Seed Legals, actually my, my joke is my co-founder gave me a 49,000 line spreadsheet that he'd been working on for six months. And he went, great, Anthony, we've met at this event. Let's do something together. Can you code this? And I said, uh, no, there are two problems. One, it's, it's impossible. And number two, even if you built it, no one would be able to use it because it's insanely complicated. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to build a fraction of it, uh, omit two thirds of all the deal terms, and then see when you have a customer that wants it. And if they want it, we'll build that feature. And you know, very quickly over the first few rounds, you realize which things people want and, and which don't. And we're now learning that all over again as we do our exit product, where we think there need to be all these features for it, but we're going to learn as we talk to people, oh, we don't need this feature, but we desperately need these feature. So having as many people in your team talk to customers as possible is essential. That includes the tech team who should get on customer calls, even if they listen in, uh, the product team who should, uh, and and certainly the founders as well. And, and if you don't, you, you're really living a bit in isolation. Not to get too granular, but what are the types of questions that you're asking? And then also, especially as you have a larger team now, how do you track that feedback? Great question. So you might put it in two phases. One is we want to build something and we want to discover before we build it whether we should spend or waste time building it. And the other one is we've built something and we now want to figure out how people are using it, which things they don't understand and which things we should build next. So let's start with the first part because all companies start there, which is you've got this genius idea that you want to build and, uh, and, and now you want to go and validate it ideally before you spend huge amounts of time building it. And uh, so how do you learn what people really want. Well, there are, very, there are lots of mock-up tools available, Marvel, InVision, and others. You can make a clickable mock-up of your products, and you can sit with people to go and click through it. And you should actually go off and find your real audience and sit with them and, and have them tested. You can bring your product person, you can bring your developer with you, because otherwise, if you don't bring your developer with you, um, what happens, you get back to the office or you guys spoke to customer, they didn't understand it at all. And then your developer will tell you that they're completely in denial. And uh, what do you mean? They didn't know, of course, but, but having them see somebody struggle, just not knowing the button to click is the fastest way to understand what, what customers uh, really want. So now what we do at C Legals, so, you know, when you have a web chat with us, our support team, if they need help, they'll post in a Slack channel. So we've got several dedicated Slack channels, one is about employment questions, one about legal, one about funding, and then second level support will hop in. But everyone in the company can see those questions. And I personally, for better or worse, will also hop in. So it becomes firstly a collaborative affair. And secondly, our product team are looking. So the third time somebody goes, I, I don't know where to send the share certificates, the team will hopefully pick up and go, we should improve that. And then there's a product suggestions channel so that all of our support team, if they are finding several people asking for the same thing, they'll put it as a product suggestion and the product team will pick that up. And sometimes personally, I will pick it up at midnight and code it if it's a you know hint text or some small change so that you react as quickly as possible to the things people want. Uh, so that you reduce friction and uh, help people get to the, the the pieces they want. And then for any uh, features that your customers are looking for, those also get put into a Slack channel so that everyone can see it. And then one of our product team members will take those and put them in Trello where they'll get prioritized. So really, I, I, I don't claim you know perfection or success. It's a journey for me as much as anyone else. But my goal is that everyone in the company is obsessed and focused around uh, looking at 
customer incomings and then building everything around that. And I should add that the starting point is the intercom or now HubSpot web chat, because I think too many companies, they just create a website. Here you are coding away, here's a website, and there's just no connection between the two. But putting a, a web chat bubble on your site transforms customer drive-bys into conversations. So there your goal is to come up with some engaging message that when somebody comes to your public website or your logged in site, you don't just say, hello, how can I help? I mean, you could do that, but if you can come up with something, you know, a bit more interactive, are you looking to do a funding round or an option scheme and invite the person to engage? And then all these drive-bys become conversations and then you'll learn what people want and also what people don't want. And, and so I highly encourage that. Now, if you are, of course, uh, having a social network with 100,000 users, that's if you're using Intercom, it's going to get very expensive. If you've got a small number of paying users, then that works out well. So, uh, so yes, that, that's the way that uh, I and we try to do it at Seed Legals. So sorry, did you say that was Intercom or HubSpot that you use for the little? So we, we used, it's a good point actually. So what CRM to use? And I don't think we've ever finally found, well, here's, so we used to use Intercom for web chat and we used and, and we use uh, HubSpot for CRM, so for tracking. So if a sales team member talks to a customer, then we can see that, you know, Liliana spoke to Alice and uh, next time uh, Alice arrives back, we can connect with Liliana. So you'll want a, a CRM ultimately for your lead tracking, customer engagement, if you've got an account manager, because as your team grows, Initially, you've got three people, and it's fine. You know, they're talking. Uh, a, a customer is talking to one of three people. But when it gets to fifty people, then of course, it you you need better organizational tools. But what we found is, I love Intercom for customer web chat. It's awesome, but it wasn't connecting to the sales team and calls and tracking. So we decided to move it all into HubSpot. I think HubSpot told their team just copy Intercom and uh, they've mimicked it, but I didn't really like the workflow. It's a bit more frustrating. So my top tip is if you can use Intercom, use Intercom. Otherwise, if you have to centralize everything in HubSpot, you know, that, that, that works with a little bit of frustration. And I haven't tried uh, Salesforce or other tools, uh, mostly because they seem hideously expensive and, and old school, but, but I should look at them. All right. Um, obviously, this next question will be heavily shaped by the current funding market. But how do you view growth versus profitability? Right. And this is a fascinating question that goes right back to the beginning of seed legals. So and I think this is really core to, to the way you want to build your company as a founder and whether you want to go off to VCs or not. So let me start at the beginning, which is when we started Seed Legals, Laura and I, my co-founder, were funding the business ourselves, and we put quite a lot of our own money into the business. But you know, initially it's a thousand pounds a month, then it becomes two thousand, then it becomes four thousand a month, and pretty soon, you know, your spouse is going to notice that um, the bank balance is going down, and there'll be a discussion about you should find other investors because it's not going to be sustainable. So your challenge arrives when the rate at which you need to fund the business for it to keep growing outpaces what you can do yourself. And now you need to raise investment money. But at that point, you've now got a bit of a choice, which is should you aim for maximum growth? So you're going to raise a million pounds and you're now going to look to spend that in 12 months. You're going to double or triple the team size. You're going to buy lots of Facebook or Google ads. Uh, and if things go well, you're going to raise it, you know, 5x the valuation in 12 to 18 months. But the problem is if things don't go well, you're on this treadmill and you're hemorrhaging lots of money before you've got revenue and the business can come to a sudden and grinding unwanted exit. The other end of the extreme is you aim to get to cash flow break even, if not profitability. So you go, I don't want to be beholden to running out of money and having to raise. So I'm going to limit my burn rate so that I can grow as far as possible organically. 
But of course, just organically is too slow because if you can, you know, you have to pay developers to build something before you, you can do anything. So my business partner and I agreed that we would uh, initially uh, have a burn rate of £10,000 a month. And so as we got revenue, we would grow the team so that we're all always, you know, uh, minus 10 grand a month. And then after our series A, we increase that to minus uh, 40K a, a month. Sorry, at our, our first round, we to 40K a month, which would last us two years. And even after our series A, our goal was to stay there. So between myself and my co-founder to now get to the fun part of your question, we see things from different, slightly different views. So I'm the, yeah, we should go and spend all our, rah, this is insane. We should hire way more people and do another round. I mean, you know, we, we specialize in funding rounds. And Laura, who's an ex-VC and serial angel investor, surprisingly says, no, we should look to get to cash flow break even or a small burn rate to grow uh, and not be beholden to VC rounds. And then we joke between each other who's right. And when uh, things are good, and then I go to Laura, dude, we should really have you know, grown much. We could be in the US already in these other eight territories. And then COVID arrives or Brexit or Ukraine. And Laura goes, you see, I was right. We'd have a big problems if we'd gone crazy. So, and, and now in our board meetings with Index Ventures, you know, for the last since 2019, when they invested, they've been saying, Anthony and Laura, you need to spend our money. We didn't give you our money to keep in the bank. Cut to starting about six months ago, Anthony and Laura, I'm so pleased you didn't spend all of our money because some of our investments are, are hemorrhaging 10 million a month and it's a disaster zone. So, the, uh, so, so really, ultimately, it's a choice that you need to make. And, and I don't know the right one, right? Because I see other companies that spend huge amounts. And certainly when times are good, it seems like it's the right strategy. But times may not always be good. And there's nothing like knowing that you have you know, years of runway or you cash flow break even. And if you don't go crazy on paying for Google or Facebook ads, then you, you know, aren't about to run out of money. Now, of course, this only applies once you've got revenue. But Jen, just to wrap up this answer, I think that you might put your company's growth into before you've got revenue and after you've got revenue. So before you've got revenue and maybe call it product market fit, you don't know if people are really going to want what you're building. You hope they do. That's why you made the, the, the company. But until you've verified it, the question is how fast you want to grow. And as a founder, multiple times, I know that you get into this mindset that you're one feature away from being what people want. You know, if only I had this extra feature, everyone would want it. And so you're going to spend more on more team and building more features. But in fact, adding more features may not help at all. People might be wanting something a bit different or not wanting this at all. So what you, I think the uh, wrap up advice is broadly, you're going to have, you know, two gears in your company. In first gear, you are going to limit your rate of growth and not go crazy on hiring while you find product market fit. In other words, will there be people who will want and buy your uh, products for less than the cost and, and, and their lifetime value will be less than the cost of acquiring a customer and they'll tell their friends. And until then, you should act as if this period might be ongoing for an indeterminate amount of time and only grow the business uh, based on being able to see it out for some period. But once you have gotten to that point where you have paying customers and you can scale, this is usually at sort of series A or territory when investors will look at your revenue growth and give you large amounts of money to give right back to Facebook and Google to buy more ads for more customers. So, so I think it's a sort of two phase approach, but I uh, always enjoy the healthy discussion with my co-founder on whether we should or should not, you know, get to cash flow break even or go crazy. So 
Um, on the topic of thinking that you're one feature away from finding product market fit, how do you know what customer feedback or uh, trends you're seeing in the engagement metrics are red herrings and which ones are, you know, there's something valuable there that you want to pursue? It's a, it's probably the, in all of my founder life, the most difficult problem. It's not fundraising, it's not team, it's actually finding what customers want. And you might get lucky and you get a clear indication that they want, but it might turn out you're wandering in the wilderness for quite some period. And there, for example, uh, I think maybe if I go back a, a couple of startups to, my, to Beamly, my TV app, you'd find there was a certain uptake you weren't quite sure what your audience wanted. Was it a means to remote control their TV or to get synchronized experience or, or social? And your team was going, well, the social loop isn't quite there. We have to add a feature for it. And the other team was saying, well, we have to add these other features to support these other TVs. And in all cases, you're thinking if, uh, you know, I it's hard for me to say no to what I, I think will be a solution. But part of your mind is saying, I'm just investing more and more in something, and I don't know if people really want to do it. And, and now your problem is, for technical problems, you know that work is needed to get to a solution. If I do this work, I'll have the solution. But for product market fit, I think the challenge is you don't know the path to get there. So I was talking to a Seed Legal's customer this morning in the travel space, and they've been struggling to find something that their customers are looking for. And, you know, should it be paper-based? Should it be digital? Should it be, should they be marketing to corporates or should they be marketing to individuals? And uh, they've tried several things over the years and never really figured it out. And they hope that they've now got a partner that will want it and they have to invest quite a lot to build the product that that person wants. Now, you know, maybe the, the issue is as a founder, every time you are betting on a new feature, you're really rolling the dice. And when you raise investment, you get, you buying yourself a certain number of rolls of the dice. So you can either make lots of small rolls or like one big roll, but if it doesn't work, you're, you're out of cash. And, and that's kind of the way I think about it, which is you're only going to make a big roll of the dice if all other bets are not paying off and it's your one last chance. But of course, that's like super dangerous. And it's very rare that you launch something and people want it immediately. Always more is needed. I know that I'm somewhat rambling here, but I don't, I've never found, you know, a perfect answer. And I know it's the most stressful to me piece because when your team are going oh wise one what do we do next did you go dude i you can't go do it i have the slightest idea because everyone will walk out but uh, you actually don't know and how do you engage your team how do you engage customers and how do you look to within to find out what is the answer for what to do next to get to that elusive thing that your customers will want but whatever it is you want to try and learn as quickly as possible through prototyping, ideally, before you spend many weeks or months on the next major version and only then learn, because otherwise you've got fewer remaining rolls of the dice. Michael in the chat has said, um, we're definitely one feature away from a huge success. The only issue is that we don't know which feature, which I think sums <laughs> up what you said perfectly. <laughs> exactly. That, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay, um, last question on metrics before we move on to pricing. Um, you mentioned a bit around communicating where you're at to your team. Uh, so, But the first question on metrics is how often do you track it and share it with your team? And then also, how do you shape that narrative with the team? Like if you do have a down month or there are negative external factors, um, how are you transparent with the team, but also, uh, you know, instill a sense of confidence? Great question. And I think it varies uh, and changes with the life and, and the growth of the company. So, you know, in the early days of the company, you, you're still working on your products. So there really aren't any metrics. At least you don't have users. So what metrics might you have? They're obviously going to be very soft metrics. 
How, how many sprint points did we deliver? Did we, how many features did we ship? How many customers did we, potential customers did we talk to? So, you know, you, you, you try to figure out some measure of traction that, it, that helps you. Um, and also if investors ask, you've got something to show them. The next thing is maybe you, you have a product that's live and you actually can track easily enough with Google Analytics on your website. And of course, if you're using any payment system, you'll have a measure of revenue. And then you may have put Google Analytics in your app so you can see what, uh, how customers are interacting and then you'll have some retention numbers. But at this stage of the business, maybe you don't have that many users. So the data is really noisy and you don't have a dedicated data person so it's, you know, on an ad hoc basis, if you are a data-driven founder and you've got time, you'll focus on it. And if not, you know, some time may go by. Uh, and then eventually you uh, have grown enough that you've got a dedicated person on to produce data. And the problem with producing data is the data person produces lots of data that nobody ever looks at. So now you have to try and get the team fixated on data spoon feed in a sense the data and so at sea legals for example and this probably started maybe two years ago we've got monthly okr meetings so for each of our teams this would be the tech product team sales uh, customer support legal you know hr they would all have their own okrs and okr is a objective and a key indicator uh, or key results so to me, that is, you know, pick three important metrics for your team. What, what are they? How did you do this month? And what are you going to do to make it better next month? And so, for example, our customer support team would track the net promoter score and customer satisfaction. They might uh, track the median response time that Intercom will show that we responded to customers. Our sales team would have, or marketing team might, for example, have web traffic and retention rate and conversion rate from the homepage. So the, the goal for me is not that, you know, as a CEO and a data person or something, we just come up with these numbers, but instead it gets devolved. So each team needs to come up with its own definitions of what's important to it and track it. And they might be quite surprising. So for example, when I asked our CTO to come up with their metrics, it's like, dude, I don't have metrics. Well, you must have metrics. How many points do you ship each sprint? Or what's the median time from having an idea to shipping it? So once the team get together and come up with numbers that they see as important for them, then that team gets around it. And then you, the, the bit that you centralize is helping them to provide the Google Analytics, the you know the numbers that they need to to build their uh, their, their OKRs. So I, that said, we've we've somewhat downplayed the OKRs because I think it gets a bit repetitive every month. They look sort of well, it's gone up a little bit. This is up a bit. This is down a bit. It it feels a bit same same. So I think we're having a break from that for a few months and then we'll get back to that because anytime you do things many times, the, the, you have to find a, a pattern that keeps exciting. But, but the short answer to me is try to get each of your teams, you know, and when you have three people in the company, that, that's kind of a bit of a moot point, but try to have them figure out something that's important for them and you might then guide them or have a separate set that's important overall for the company, which could be uh, obviously revenue or users. It might be team happiness. Uh, there may be other you know, metrics that are important. All right, um, so we're gonna move on to pricing and then Jay will take a question from the chat. Reminder, ask your, or raise your hand if you want to ask the question live. Um, okay, so pricing, um, obviously you have a lot of different uh, pricing models, you have the membership component, you have the like flat fee and then the sliding structure depending on how much you're raising. And then now plus two, so the bundle package. So how do you go about strategizing, uh, you know, your pricing strategy, especially for a SaaS tool when there's not as many uh, fixed fees? I, I'll start with the joke on is you look at HubSpot's pricing and you do the opposite of what they do. They have an insanely complicated pricing model that I can never understand. No, but jokes aside, I think, uh, you know, consistently we hear that customers love our support and platform. 
less keen on the pricing, I think. And interestingly, from what I see, customers delight in paying us several thousand pounds for a funding round, but don't seem keen to pay 49 pounds per month. And it's it's quite strange. Somebody might raise a million pounds, happily pay the funding round, and then next month go, you know, are we sure we need to subscribe? It's like, dude, you raised a million pounds. The 49 pounds is small in the scheme of things. So I don't in any way claim to know the answer. But what we've tried to do, and this is my work in progress, and I'm delighted that people reach out and tell me what I'm doing right or wrong or could do better. But what we try to, what, what we've realized is you, you've always got, by the way, a few competing things. Your investors are always trying to push you to a SaaS model. Investors love SaaS models. Anytime you're on a SaaS recurring billing, you're more investable than not. On the flip side, I can't say I'm going to charge a thousand pounds a month forever and funding rounds are now a SaaS service. It doesn't work because when you do your funding round, you, you're delighted to pay a certain amount because you know the alternative is a lawyer, but between funding rounds, you don't want to pay much. So the, some things just don't work as a SaaS model and, and, and you have to respect that. So where we've ended up is to try and figure out the things you need all the time the little things all the time, agreements on a SaaS model, and the things you need sometimes on a one-off basis, which turn out to be a recurring one-off because you know you want your SEIS advance assurance, and then you might do a seed fast, then you might do a funding round. So it's it's a balancing act, and uh, you know we've we've uh, essentially been trying to tweak it as the years go by, particularly as you enhance the platform. So once upon a time. Life was easy. We only had a small set of things on seed legals, and there was just like it was twenty nine pounds a month plan, and and then you could buy you know one offs, and then we added features for later stage companies. So we went okay, we'll go with a small, medium, and large. You know, start, grow, run, uh, to try and map the size of companies because we know if it's two people and you haven't raised funding, you don't have much money to spend. But on the other hand, I know I spend thousands with HubSpot, Intercom, Stripe, and others. So as a larger company, you, you're happy to pay substantial amounts for things that give you a lot of business benefit. So could you create a pricing model to reflect that? But that then led to the problem of which things are in the different models. And you know, I want a data room and I have to grow to the other model. So that we, we had that and it, it was okay, I think. But then we decided that we would go for a different model, which is essentially the full stack. So here for our plus plan are the things for everything you need for your startup. And, and we'll price it as an annual package and add in the set of things that you need, but you also can go monthly. And that from a uh, sales perspective, and it seems from a customer perspective is, uh, is going really well. Uh, people love the uh, the single purchase that gives them a range of things and savings, and your churn rate on annual is usually a lot less than on monthly. So that is a big win, and it creates a simplicity as well. It's sort of monthly or annual with a range of things thrown in. But I don't pretend in any way it's the end game. We, for example, want to create products now for investors, and investors, will they have a different plan or not? So I think the the fund the the uh, the pricing is something that evolves with time has competing interests uh, and of course always when your startup uh, when when your market are startups and early stage founders or founders who are having trouble fundraising it is always you know difficult to match what you need to run a business and your customer support time with what you'd like to do, which is give everything for free. And, and I don't claim to know the answer, but just now so that everyone is aware, you know, it, it's it, it's something that I, I don't think is, it's an ongoing attempt to bet, best match what we uh, would like, what investors want and what customers want. And, and, and that changes as, and every time you've got you think you've got it right, then of course you come up with new products and then you have to try and figure out where they fit and then you, the model doesn't work anymore. 
Okay, we're going to start with questions from the chat. Um, and everyone, while we spoke around pricing and product roadmap, um, Anthony has a wealth of knowledge of everything he could possibly imagine about startups. So if you have a question about pitching, investors, cap table, um, now's a good time to ask. First question is going to be from David. How small can micro product market fit look in today's cash strapped market? Uh, so David, can you tell me more about what how small i mean is it targeting yeah. a very small audience or is it like one feature that people want over to you yeah so, so it's kind of it's kind of like about extrapolating metrics so i've bootstrapped today um and i've i've got some great metrics so for example i've got 100 percent retention after 12 months so that's something that that you don't normally see but it's off one pilot club right so um and okay, I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got enough info to answer. Yeah. Um, so the, the answer, I think, is that as an investor, you're always trying to pick up bits of signal from the noise, right? You see lots of companies and they show you lots of glossy pitch decks and they're upselling you bold visions and you have no idea what's going to work and what's not going to work. So you're trying to use any data points you can and you're going to put a weighting factor on it, which is going to influence how likely you are to invest and the valuation of the company. So the best proof point is, you know, you're doing a million pounds a month in revenue and it's growing, you know, uh, 2x year on year. You almost don't need to ask what the company does. You just look at the Excel graph and you go, you validated you can build a team, you validate you can build a product, you validated that people will pay for it, and you validated you can generate enough leads to grow the business. So I'm in. And of course, if you can get there, that's awesome. But the fact we're on the call probably means we're not. So now you go back a step. So you don't have revenue, but you've got, you know, Google Analytics showing you the number of people to your website and the number of people signing up. But you're not there yet. You're earlier than that. So at each stage, investors are, you know, ascribing a lower valuation to the business. In earlier stages, VCs will drop out and will be angel investors. Sorry, the sun's coming out, which is great. I'm going to move the blinds in a second. Um, so uh, in earlier stages, you, you, you're going to have angel investors. So there's nothing wrong with uh, having sort of more micro metrics, but it's going to be matched by investors doing more micro amounts. And you may find just based on, you know, one pilot, you might be able to raise 150 or 200 or 300,000 pounds from angels, have five pilots, maybe that now becomes you can raise a million pounds because you've got more validation so as long as you understand the 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 um, the quality of the data and the comprehensiveness of the data is going to match the valuation and size of the round then that's how you're going to go from you know i'm investing with just on a hunch and your pitch check and i love the founders spiel and and i'm going to invest 20k on you know 200k round through to a, a larger investment later on all right, and now we're going to take a question from Jay. Um, what is the best way to cross the user density threshold in a marketplace model? Okay, can you tell me what you mean more by that, Jade? Uh, Jay. Hi, Anthony. Uh, oh, sorry. Hi, Jay. Yeah. So, so in a marketplace model, of course, you need it. You need to connect the demand and supply. And you need users from both the side uh, until the model go into Got it. Got the semi-auto yeah. mode. For example, Tinder, Uber, you, you need users from the side. I've got, enough, I've got enough info now, right. So, I mean, the marketplace model is, of course, particularly challenging because you have to do both. And uh, I was at a talk some years ago with Reid Hoffman where he was explaining starting LinkedIn. And LinkedIn obviously only works if there are people to link to. Otherwise, it's no good. So he was saying, how do you get, you know, to create the network? And he's saying the answer is you provide utility first. So you give people some reason, some value, even without connecting with others. Maybe it was building your resume page or something like that. And then later on, you've got the network effect. And I must say on Seed Legals, that's very much my goal, which is first build a utility. You can come and do a contract. Um, but with lots of uh, founders and lots of investors, the next step is now to build that utility and start connecting founders, investors. And that's my plan for later on in the year. So 
I would, uh, you know, I, I'm not at all an expert on marketplaces, but I would say there are two things. Number one is, can you provide just a utility for at least one of the parties to, so that they can do something first? They can create their portal page and they can use it to share that and they'll get some value from it. And then the next thing is, there are many marketplaces which are, you, you have to work harder to acquire one than the other. So you may find that actually you, you want to do, let's say, some doctor thing. You can find 10 doctors manually and just get them on board and now just focus 100% of your time on acquiring patients. Um, and then at some point, it will be a true marketplace with doctors, but you only needed a few to, to prime it. And that's probably where you're going to go. But if you find something where you have to perfectly match both and you have to get both to scale, then you've got a much more difficult problem and you have to have a great pitch deck and a great pitch to get enough funding to do it. And your question is how you can uh, uh, bypass that to give, uh, you know, to, to, to get, I guess, it working asymmetrically until you can make it work symmetrically. All right. Um, there was someone who just Thank had their hand, their hand raised that I was about to call on, but they put their hand down. So if you want oh. to ask it. <clears throat> Sorry, it was me, actually, Raj. Um, my question was almost uh, synonymous with what we, what he just asked. You know, uh, my question was, um, uh, where should be the uh, marketing effort should be? Because I have a, a two-sided marketplace. Uh, we are an online service booking company, and um, we have service businesses like gutter cleaners, domestic cleaners, uh, um, all sort of home service uh, um, providers on one side, and uh, consumers like you and me on the other side. So um, we just launched our booking app, but um, my 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 uh, angel investor is asking me to focus on getting the consumers. But um, my, I have this uh, dilemma that uh, if, if consumer is not, if consumers are coming into the platform and trying to search for any service and they don't find them in their postcode, they, they may get disappointed and leave the platform and they may never come back. So um, I have this dilemma, how to focus this. And um, my initial thought was to um, um, scale them in a way that they gradually uh, marry with each other, you know, like uh, we have enough business to feed enough customers to start with and then slowly build them on top of each other. Um, yeah, any 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 comments? Uh, would right. Be uh, Thank so you. It's, uh, I, I mean, the, the, there's, there's a ton of stuff one could go down, but I think the first thing, obviously, if you've got a website that's designed around search by postcode, you setting yourself up for it's not going to work unless most postcodes are going to hit or you've got a search algorithm that you know finds within 50 miles so i would say my first tip so uh, as i might have in someone else's business is set up the website to frame the question to get the kind of answer that's going to work for your stage of the company so if you ask people to enter a postcode you better have a very wide matching system or it's mostly not going to match but instead you might say you know you pick one of 10 cities and and now it becomes oh i'm just picking manchester and 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 so now you're going to find it's going to feel set up for the scale you've got until you move to postcode the the next thing of course is you may find that you can't spread your firepower that wisely widely and you're just going to launch in one city first and and solve that city and then do other cities afterwards um the other thing is of course, uh, if you do exceed demand for people looking for cleaners, maybe you can find cleaners faster than you can find other customers, or you can go and find somebody who's got a service for cleaners and do some partnership deals. So I, obviously I don't know this market, but I uh, my starting point is to figure out what is the hardest part of the problem to solve, uh, into which probably is getting paying customers. So how can you give them what appears to be the swan gliding over the surface in your website, while be beneath the surface, you're finding, making phone calls to, to match people up. And, and, and once you're doing that enough, then you'll automate that part of it. Thank you so All much. Right. Going to take um, a quick question from Tim in the chat, and then Ludmila, Mila, I'll go over to you. Um, so Tim asked Anthony, "Do you have a North Star metric?" Um, 
Yes. Uh, for me, it's like percent of all funding rounds in the UK done on seed legals is my North Star metric. Uh, my colleagues would focus perhaps more on, uh, you know, revenue and my marketing team on, you know, acquisition. But for me, it's uh, to me personally, I get upset when someone doesn't do a funding round on seed legals. So for me, it's having 100% uh, of funding rounds on seed legals. Okay, everyone, I mean, hopefully you're doing it already. You better make sure to do your funding round and seed legals. Oh, you don't need to please me, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, Lidmila, over to you. Hi, Anthony. Thank you for all the answers uh, here today. We um, we kind of uh, get inspired by seed legals a lot in my, my company because we, we keep saying that we want to be... Uh, to uh, to learning and development the same that seed legals is for uh, legals for startups so we kind of uh, keep trying to learn as much as possible with you guys and uh, and how you started so one thing that we have been listening to from investors especially in these early stages is uh, why are you chasing startups they don't have money uh, and they are quite difficult to sell uh, and retain them um, why not chase uh, enterprise and then we say okay because enterprise has already have these solutions for learning and development but not necessarily startups and scale-ups and how how have you uh, did you face this in the beginning how uh, was the discussion about selling to uh, smes and startups in the beginning of seed legals it's a great question. I don't think I had that one that clearly, but you know, whatever you do, you always have naysayers and uh, you know, it's like, no, people always want to create word docs with red line changes. You'll never be able to automate that. And uh, no, everyone always wants a lawyer and you know, whatever, and there's endless numbers of things. And if you listen to every person who says, no, you'll never do anything. But of course, you know, buried within each reason for not doing it is a nugget that you have to overcome because if lots of people think about that. So I, I think that's thing number one. Thing number two is uh, you should take care who you listen to and then use that data to disprove the, the naysayers. So for example, when I started see legals, I went to talk to law firms and they all told me what I was going to do wasn't going to work. And the only thing I learned was stop talking to law firms because they're going to tell you that they want to preserve their business. I've got nothing against law firms, but I was just, it, it wasn't, it was great so that they knew about what I was doing, but not great in telling me what, what others should do. And instead I learned to go and talk to customers. And I learned that uh, if you solve a customer problem, they no, don't even think that it's necessary legals, uh, you know, like, oh, uh, there's a place I can go to do one of these agreements and I can do it on a Sunday. Great. So, and now you've got people that want what you've got. And of course, you've built something they want. And you now take that data to go to everyone else. So I would say if you are a wellness platform and your investors are saying you should sell elsewhere, I mean, one, one way is to go, well, you know, uh, I have to pick somewhere, leave it with me. Of course, they might say, thanks, I'm out. But uh, how might you use some data to show that actually startup founders are the fastest decision makers because they've got endless numbers of problems that they've got to figure out each day. If they spend ages on anything, they'll never get anywhere. They're used to making SaaS purchase decisions in minutes. I need this thing. Great. I'm going to sign up with this lead gen tool. Um, they, 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 they are changing the world themselves with SaaS solutions. So they're going to sign up to similar ones because it's in their mindset and they probably want to support fellow founders as well. So you're going to try and show that that's a good thing to do uh, to persuade them over to your point. While of course, at the same time, exploring other areas, just in case they're completely right. You might go to SMEs and find it's actually a better fit uh, or not, but but maybe the short answer is to try and quickly uh, try across a range of areas to get enough data points so you can answer with data rather than just, you know, it's a great question. My gut tells me I should do X. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Francisco. Uh, thank you. Hi, Anthony. Good to see you. Um, hi. Hi. Hey, hi. I absolutely love Sid Legals in a, in the but um I wanna a question for you is that 
one of the things that I absolutely love about Sid Legals, obviously the platform and the features and the simplification of the whole process, etc., cetera, um, is fantastic. But one thing that I love about Sid Legals is that my investors of my uh, pre-seed round were more confident just because I was on Sid Legals. Was that a deliberate thing? Um, it was actually my biggest problem to solve because when you're a when when you start a company, you've usually got uh, the following problems to solve. One, can I can I build it? Can I hire people and create a team? Can I get investment? Can I create something that my customers will want? So th those are your usual things. Uh, and I was, uh, and my business partner and I had been around for a while, so we were confident we could solve those. But we had one other unknown, which is, will your investors let you use it? What if I make the system and you love it? And then the investors go, no, no, we want lawyers. And so I was quite delighted when I learned just the opposite of that, which is actually investors hate the faffing around and uh, and saw the fact that they had standardized documents and the ones that the platform created. So you couldn't modify them other than the deal terms. And that led to a certain level of trust. And so, the, and, and that I think was surprising, which is that people trusted the platform uh, and, and our team, but then also then puts the bar very high so that we know that we cannot do anything that betrays that trust. Because, you know, you, we all see companies that we've trusted, and they fuck up eventually, and then you don't like them anymore. So how do we make sure that the documents are always, you know, unchanged and the, the advice is correct and it uses openness and, and data to show both parties what to do and so on. And that's going to be important in the things we do. But I think ultimately, uh, you know, to maybe wrap this up, often you think that you, you're you building, in this case, you know, legal tech platform, and then you realize that, you know, like nobody actually wants legals, they want a solution. And when I look at our, my competitors, which are, you know, law firms, they, their solution is a pile of papers. My solution is, you know, anything from a webinar to videos to data, you know, to to WhatsApp chats that will be answered at midnight to whatever to to give you the things that you want. And oh, by the way, it makes some documents. And uh, and my goal in this year is to try and replicate that on the investor side a lot more. In fact, you know, tomorrow actually we're going live with an investor version of C Legals. You'll see an extra gizmo in the interface that uh, you know, if you're an investor. Uh, we'll we'll give you a much richer interface, and we'll develop it from there. So I think it's it's ultimately about empowerment and trust in almost anything you do. And by the way, one uh, thing which is, you know, in the early stages of a company, we're talking about you know, you know you know how to market. And for me, content marketing is super important. So I think for um, I think it might have been. Not sure who was asking about the marketplace cleaners and so on you know you you acquiring your end customers can be quite expensive but what if you could have a range of articles on these are the things to look out for these are the the cleaning things to leave out or this is what you'd expect to pay or here's how to tell if your cleaner's done a good job or here are three tricks to use to see if they've done things whatever it might be so when people get to your site i mean it's free you're not paying big bucks for it but it's seo people will spend more time on the site they'll trust it um and and also there might be people who are not ready to commit, but they'll come by, see some good articles and remember it and come later. So, you know, if if you write six articles on different things or you get your team to do it, you're also writing these articles are essentially at low cost discovering product market fit. Because if you can't explain easily what you do in an article, it's going to be much harder on the website as well. But now you can have things that people can engage with and read, which will lead to more trust before they go off and commit. Thank you. All right. Last, last question is, um, as you've mentioned that, you know, you're constantly chatting with founders, whether that be on Slack, WhatsApp at midnight or on Zoom calls, um, what are like the one or two things that um, you really wish founders would stop or start doing? Um, so the, the, the million 
or multi-million dollar question. I think as a founder, your biggest challenge is how much of your own Kool-Aid to drink. So, you know, you, you need to be, uh, of course, optimistic. You want to have a vision. But if you believe uh, your own hype too much, then you're going to think that you're correct in the absence of any validation and just go off and, and do stuff, which there's a chance will work, but there's a great chance it won't. On the other hand, if you're unable to take any risk or you're constantly listening for people to tell you what you're doing is correct, then then you'll never do anything. So, you know, listening to some of the questions on the call, you know, uh, my investors are saying this, this is wrong. Well, your challenge is, is the investor right or should you ignore them? And I think one of the things when I talk to founders, I'm always trying to find on the call what is the right balance that I'm hearing between this uh, you know, unbridled enthusiasm, whatever it takes, I've got this vision, we're going to ship it. But at some point, it crosses over into, um, you know, you're delusional, it's just not going to work. You're not listening to the real world. People aren't actually going to want this, which is okay, because we all build things and, and then discover people don't want it. But then you want to modify what you're doing rapidly to to work out what they want but some people are so you know doggedly on it and it reminds me of the person who, who i think patented the intermittent windscreen wiper that you know sits for a while then does this again i think he sat and trying to enforce the patent for 20 years um while the the auto manufacturers in the us you know ignored it or copied it or whatever you know it's like he kept going for 20 years and eventually got some huge payment. But, but I mean, who would have, you know, spent all that time as opposed to getting on with their life, doing other things. And I, I liken it to, to this. So it's uh, for, for me and everyone else to figure out how much do you, of course, you need to project with your team, customers and investors, this uh, vision that you've got. But of course, within you need to be aware that that's, partly what you're really doing, partly it's a projection and partly it's going to be, you know, based on underpinnings that may change and then you need to change that. So I think that's probably the one thing. Perfect. That's a great way to end it. Um, I'm going to hit stop record.